Well, welcome back to our class entitled Living Without Shame. We are now in the second section of the class. Can we really live without shame? And the answer, of course, to that is yes. If we are trusting in the Lord, waiting upon the Lord, tonight we'll be looking at hoping in the Lord. If we embrace God as refuge and embrace him as truth, uh, we will be well on the path to living without shame. Uh, there's a sense in which we never do when we're in Jesus Christ because we are washed clean. We are white as snow. And so in Jesus Christ, we are people who trust and wait and hope and embrace God as refuge and embrace him as truth. The bottom line under the new covenant is to embrace Jesus Christ as Savior. And when we do that, we are not ashamed and we can live without shame. Uh, tonight, we'll be looking at hoping in the Lord. Our main passage will be from Psalm 69. We'll look at the whole psalm tonight. Uh, verse 6, though, is the explicit statement concerning shame and hope. Uh, we will also look at Romans 5, not just verses 3 through 5, but actually we'll look at 1 through 11. And while we are looking at Psalm 69, uh, twice in verse 9, the, the first phrase of verse 9, and then the second verse, second part of verse 9, um, those are quoted in the New Testament. Uh, the first part in uh, the Gospel of John, and the second part in the book of Romans. So we'll be looking at a couple extra passages as we do that as well. So anyway, let's dive right in. I think you will really um, be encouraged uh, by what we have uh, to look at uh, this evening for this class. Can we really live without shame? The answer is yes. And part of our faith, part of what we do in Christ is hope in the Lord. We look forward to with assurance. Hope in the Bible is not crossing your fingers and wondering about something. Hope in the Bible is assurance. It's something that we have confidence in. It hasn't happened yet, though, so we hope for it. We we wait for it. It's very similar, as we spoke last week, with the idea of waiting. All of this, there is great assurance, great conviction concerning what is going to take place in the future. All right, so Psalm 69, it is a Psalm of David. He begins, Save me, O God. For the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. So this is quite a dire situation. Uh, that David finds himself in. Of course, we know that David uh, many times was dealing with enemies, and not just enemies like we might deal with, but enemies that actually wanted to take his life, actually wanted to kill him. Now, we do have an enemy, a spiritual enemy, who wants to destroy us spiritually. He wants us to lose our faith. He wants us to die spiritually. He wants us to fall away from the Lord. And of course, that is Satan, that is the devil, the deceiver. And he constantly is after us like a roaring lion, wanting to devour us. So our enemy, even worse than the physical enemies that David had, we just don't experience it in a physical way. But there are times that we may feel like we are in deep mire, where there's no foothold, where we're about to drown in deep waters, floods sweeping over our face. We might feel this way sometimes, and we can call out to God just as David does. Save me, O God. I did highlight the last part of verse 3 because we talked about waiting for the Lord last week, and David is still waiting for, he says, my God. He's still waiting for his God, but his eyes are growing dim. He's really becoming weary with the persecution, with the impending doom that he feels. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. 
Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. What did I, what I did not steal, must I now restore? Oh God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. He confesses that he's done foolish things. He confesses that he has done things that are not wise, that are not in keeping with honoring God. He has committed sin, as we all do. And here we have a little twist on the idea of shame in verse 6. Let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me, O Lord God of hosts. Let not those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, O God of Israel. So let's pause here for a little bit. It's extremely interesting, and we, we talked about this during the first three weeks of the class to some extent, the idea of the cultures of the Bible being way more community-oriented than we are. He does not want his community, he does not want God's people to be put to shame because of him. He does not want them to be brought to dishonor because of him. And we find another interesting thing here. The idea of shame and dishonor obviously are parallel here. But the idea of someone who hopes in the Lord is parallel with someone who seeks the Lord. And these, of course, are both part of our faith, part of what we do as a, an individual of faith. We hope in the Lord. We seek the Lord. We wait upon the Lord. We trust in the Lord. All these different ways of really expressing the idea of reliance and faith. We submit to the Lord. We humble ourselves before the Lord. When we do, not only will we not be put to shame, but we won't cause anyone else to be put to shame either. We just don't think quite the same way that people in Bible times thought about the community and the ability to cause shame for others or honor if we do the right thing. But of course, David was a leader. David was a man who needed to do the right things, even as he, and I don't know the timing of this psalm, but if this is before he is king, if this is while he's in that state of having been anointed king, but not yet crowned king, Saul is still king um, while he's being sought after um, for his life. And so this is probably, we would imagine, he's at least looking back to that time. All right, so I, I do feel the need <laughs> to note the different ways uh, that, that God is addressed here. O Lord God of hosts, you notice that God in the the, the first time it's in verse 6, that word is in small caps, which means it is the personal name of God. Normally, that is translated into the English with the word Lord in small caps, but they did not want to say, O oh, Lord, Lord of hosts. Um, so they change it to God to make it more readable in the English, but it is, the first Lord is the idea of master. The second word there, God in the small caps, is Lord, but the personal name of God. So it's Lord Jehovah, if we were reading from the American Standard Version. Or Master Yahweh. It's, oh, my master, and then the personal name of the Lord, and then of hosts, of armies. This is pointing out the power that God has. It's really... O oh, Lord Jehovah of the angel armies would be a way to express this because the hosts are not just hosts of people, but hosts of angels typically when this expression is used. And then the second time in verse six that you see God, it's the regular word for God. It's Elohim. And so it is just the, the way we always translate that is with the word God. So sometimes you'll see Lord God, and Lord will be in small caps, and God will be written normally, and that means, O oh, Jehovah God. 
Um, but the first time here in verse six, we have the opposite of that. We have, oh, Lord Jehovah. And then the second time, simply, oh, God of Israel. All right. So moving on to verse seven, I have highlighted some of the words throughout the psalm that talk about shame, uh, the, some of the synonyms for shame. David continues to write, for it is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. The reproach and dishonor is so great that he's not even considered part of the family. He is in a place of distress. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. And we'll continue the rest of this slide after we look at the New Testament uh, citations of these phrases. So first, uh, the first half of verse 69, zeal for your house has consumed me. I think we all recognize that this is what the disciples remembered when Jesus cleansed the temple. So let's look at John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. How awesome is that? And I don't know when this remembrance was. Um, it could have been immediate or it could have been after the ascension, after Jesus gave them a little more insight, after everything had taken place. But they remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And they were able to not only realize that David had a zeal for the house of the Lord, but that Jesus the son of David had zeal for his father's house as well. All right. And then the second half of verse nine, the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. And before we read from Romans, let's just take note. Jesus told us because the world hates him, the world is going to hate us. Because the world persecutes Christ, the world is going to persecute us. This is no shocker, or at least it should not be to those of us who are Christians. We are called to suffer for the sake of Christ. And so the sufferings, the persecutions, the reproaches of those who reproach you, Christ, in our case, God, in David's case, they have fallen on me, David says. They fall on us. And we should never be surprised. In fact, Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Whoa. I mean, really, what a statement. It is quite amazing. Let's look at Romans 15. That's where this is quoted. We'll look at verses 1 through 7. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. And not to please ourselves, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The things we look at in the Old Testament, these were written for our instruction. Paul tells the people in Rome very explicitly this very fact. And of course, then through the Spirit and over time, he tells it to us as well. Let's finish this little section of Romans 15. 
May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. All right, let's go back to Psalm 69. So verse 9 we have read, For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and humbled my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. If you'll recall when we looked at some of the definitions of shame, one of the ideas in that word, in that idea was the idea of being a byword, being someone with no significance, someone just looked over, oh, just a passing thought or a passing word. Verse 12, I am the talk of those who sit in the gate and the drunkards make songs about me. Then he shifts a little bit here. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. At an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. David humbly asks for the prayer to be heard, but at an acceptable time. David is willing, even though he's drowning, even though his eyes can barely stay open for the waiting, he's still willing to wait. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, Turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. Draw near to my soul. Redeem me. Ransom me because of my enemies. What a beautiful section here. Really starting back on the last slide, back around verse 13 the humility, the desire for the Lord, the acknowledgement of the Lord's steadfast love and his abundant mercy, the realization that the Lord will not always hide his face from us. He will turn to us because he is full of love and mercy. And David does not hide his distress. I think it's appropriate when we are emotionally distraught to talk about it with God. He knows anyway. We can't keep it a secret from him. And so we acknowledge our distress and we let him know that we are anxious for an answer. And then verse 18, beautiful as well. Draw near to my soul. Redeem me, ransom me because of my enemies. Save me from these people who are causing me reproach and shame. Save me from these people. He continues in talking about that. You know my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My foes are all known to you. Reproaches have broken my heart so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was none, and for comforter, comforters, but I found none. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Not exactly cited when Jesus was on the cross, but probably a reference to this. Notice the result. 
fear of reproach, shame, and dishonor. It's despair. The opposite of hope. This is what we don't want to allow to happen to us. And of course, David is describing his emotions here. We see throughout the psalm, he has not given up on the Lord at all. He's praying. But he's at a point of drowning. He's at a point of a broken heart. He's at a point of despair. And he wants to be drawn out of this. In our context, when we experience and we view it as a, a realization of sin, a confession, a, a repentance, a sorrow for our sins, a godly sorrow will lead to repentance, which leads to life. A worldly sorrow leads to this despair in its ent entirety, and its fullness, which is a lack of hope and which leads to death. We want to be people who, when we bring sorrow and shame upon ourselves, when we sin, that we'll have a godly sorrow. We'll realize that and turn back to the Lord. Now, in this case, David, he acknowledges that he's a sinful man. He acknowledges sin, but the shame is being brought upon him from his enemies, from his foes. And he's at a point where he would like some victory. He would like to be brought out of this situation. That is for sure. All right, continuing on here. Let their own table before them become a snare. And when they're at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. And make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents. So really a prayer for their destruction, for their defeat. And then he gives a reason. For they persecute him whom you have struck down. And they recount the pain of those you have wounded. Add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. But I am afflicted and in pain. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. Father God, Lord of hosts, Please turn these tables. Make the situation the opposite of what it is right now. David says, I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hooves. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. David knows he will be saved by the Lord, even if he has to wait. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah, and people shall dwell there and possess it. The offspring of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. All right, so a great statement of hope as we come to the end of this psalm. Not just hope for David, but hope for the people. We saw this last week with Psalm 25, the, the constant talk of the different aspects of life. And then all of a sudden at the end, the very last verse, it shifts from the personal aspect to the community aspect. And that happens here in Psalm 69 as well. All right, just an awesome Psalm. I encourage you to, to read it without all the breaks as I uh, was kind of breaking things apart. But just at times, I feel it's important for us to read Psalms, to sing songs, to, to do things without the breaks, without the intricate word by word kind of thinking but to take it in as a whole. And so I really encourage you to do that. 
maybe after the class, just, just read through Psalm 69 from start to finish. I think that's a great blessing for us. All right, let's look at a little bit of Psalm 119, particularly verse 116, I want us to note. But as I mentioned, um, I think it was just last week, Psalm 119 is an acrostic. Uh, the first eight verses all begin with the letter Aleph in the Hebrew. The second eight verses all begin with uh, Beit. Uh, the third set of eight uh, verses, what would it be, 17 to 24, those all begin with Gimel. And so I didn't know what letter we were looking at last week, so this time I put it on in there. And so all these verses, 113 to 120, begin with an S sound. Uh, Samic is the name of the letter. And so all of them, as someone would be reading this in the synagogue, or if Christians, if someone in the Christian community had New Hebrew and they were reading this, um, you would notice very clearly, okay, all these verses start with the ah sound. All these verses start with, well, I shouldn't say it exactly that way. If you know Hebrew, the uh, the Aleph is uh, a silent letter, but still they would have known it all. They all began with Aleph. Uh, and then the next eight, they all begin with the B sound, then the G sound. And now we get down to an S sound in these verses. I hate the double minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Depart from me, you evildoers that I may keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your promise that I may live and let me not be put to shame in my hope. Hold me up that I may be safe and have regard for your statutes continually. You spurn all who go astray from your statutes for their cunning is in vain. All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. Psalm 119, several of the verses will be our theme. It'll be our theme psalm for acknowledging God as refuge, um, embracing him as truth. Uh, because this psalm talks about his statutes, his testimonies, his judgment, his law. That's what this psalm is all about. And so what a beautiful way to express the fact that we acknowledge God as truth. We embrace him in that way. So we will be looking at this psalm uh, a little bit more in two weeks. All right, so let's take a look at our New Testament passage for today. Romans 5, 3 through 5, particularly uh, talk about the hope that we have in Christ. Uh, but this whole section is quite amazing, quite a statement of faith. And so I encourage you, if you have never given your life to Christ, I encourage you to really allow these verses, Romans 5, 1 through 11. It's a statement of the gospel. It's a statement of the good news. It's it's from the perspective of those of us who are in Christ. And so if you're not in Christ, imagine being in Christ and having all of these blessings. Romans 5, 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, and what that means is we've been made right, we've been made holy not because of anything we did, but because of our faith, because we trust in the Lord. We wait upon the Lord. We hope in the Lord. We put our faith in the Lord. Faith in the Bible is always active. Faith in the Bible is always obedient. Faith in the Bible in the New Testament context very specifically includes a confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, includes repentance, in other words, a turning back to the Lord and baptism into Jesus Christ. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have contentment 
the war between us and God is gone away. We have peace with him now. We are complete and whole through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have access to God Almighty through Christ because of our faith. We have access into grace and we stand in this grace. Salvation is by faith, by grace through faith. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And again, hope in scripture is not crossing one's fingers and not being sure of something. It's really the opposite of that. It is being sure. It is having conviction. It is having confidence. So we, and that brings us hope. That's the concept of hope. This confidence and the 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 feelings and the the state that it puts us in. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. I have a friend that this has really helped. The second phrase of this, knowing that suffering produces endurance. This individual has suffered a lot. And this person takes comfort in knowing that the suffering will produce endurance. So starting in verse 3 again. Not only that, not only do we rejoice in the confidence of what is to come, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Isn't that amazing? Only someone in Christ could do this. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Never. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For those individuals who have been baptized into Christ, they have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit has been poured, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Spirit. Who has been given to us? We are the temple of the living God. God dwells in us through his spirit. Christ dwells in us through the Holy Spirit. And then notice how all this is possible. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. He paid the price for our sins. He took our place on the cross. He died even though we should have been the ones to die. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. Paul goes on to say, one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. It's possible someone would die for someone. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, okay, someone might die for a righteous person. Someone might die for a good person. We weren't that. We were sinners. And that's how much God loved us and how much Christ loved us. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And how does someone move from enemy to reconciliation? It's through faith. We just trust in this work that was done for us on the cross. And we show that faith by confessing who Jesus is, repenting, and being baptized into Jesus Christ, thereby receiving the Holy Spirit and becoming the temple, the dwelling place of the Lord. And then verse 11, more than that, 
we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We were in the same state as David. We were drowning. The floods were going over our face. We were in dire straits. But God sent Christ, and he is our Savior. All right. Next week, we will look at embracing God as refuge. We will look at Psalm 31 and Psalm 71 primarily. Obviously, we will also look at a New Testament passage, as I like to do each week. May the Lord continue to bless us and keep us as we study his word.